Hello and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Carol Looper. I'm a member of CMC's Board of Trustees and I'm a retired television news reporter, but you never retire. I'm a news junkie and proud of it. Today's CMC Forum, Sports Gambling in Ohio, question mark, is sponsored by Shoemaker Lupin Kendrick, represented here by many friends and associates. Please help me thank them. Sports are popular, and sports gambling is popular too. Betting on sports is big business, a global phenomenon, and for some, a vice that's a problem. Now, this was set free years ago in Nevada, and now, thanks to the U.S. Supreme Court, is spreading state by state across the United States, as Ohio considers the many possibilities and pitfalls of joining the party. Let's hear from our experts. Please welcome Corporate Counsel at Sport Trader, Nicole metzger Shaw, Licensed Social Worker and Nationally Certified Gambling Counselor Level 2, Bruce Jones, Partner with Shoemaker, Lupin, Kendrick, and industry expert, Kevin Bragg, and our host, Chief Editor at Columbus Business First, Doug Buchanan. Doug, the podium is yours. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Okay, well, I want to uh, get things started uh, with uh, the question that I think is on all of our minds, and that is, uh, will getting good at sports betting make me a Jeopardy champion? <laughs> no. Okay, well, we'll, uh, we'll <clears throat> actually, why don't we uh, start with, uh, uh, why don't you, since we have kind of a disparate panel here, uh, uh, starting with you, uh, Kevin, uh, just kind of explain what your uh, connection to the industry is. Sure, I'm, I'm Kevin Bragg and I'm, I'm a lawyer here in town. Um, I represent several businesses in the gaming space. Most of them do have something to do with sports betting. I've been doing it now for going on five years and um, have found a great group of people to work with. And uh, obviously it became a lot more exciting in May of 2018 when the Supreme Court struck down uh, what was known as the Professional and Amateur Sports Betting Act, or PASPA, which sort of acted as a dam. It sort of, practically speaking, kept all the sports betting that is authorized and licensed and regulated in Nevada. There are a few exceptions, but it was basically in Nevada. When the Supreme Court struck down that law, then all of a sudden it was like bursting a dam, and we've seen a tremendous amount of action in state houses around the country as states have moved to add sports betting to their menu of gaming options that already exist. Okay, Bruce. Bruce Jones, I work for Mary Haven, uh, a local drug alcohol mental health agency here in Columbus. I started our gambling program called One More Chance uh, about 10 years ago, and I get the people that have a problem with the gambling, because we know gambling is one of the number one entertainments in the world, but when it becomes problematic, we're here for them, and uh, they've been enjoying it for the last 10 years. Okay, Nicole. <clears throat> well, first and foremost, thank you so much, CMC, for having me and Sport Radar join you today. I work for a Swiss company, also here in the United States, known as Sport Radar, and we are a service provider for the digital media and sports betting industries all over the world. Um, we really have our bread and butter, per se, here at lunch today, um, helping operators, platform providers, casinos, and racetracks all over the world fuel their engine. We supply the data, the live odds, the risk management services that they need, really, to make sure that their sports book is operating smoothly and their consumers and players are remaining engaged. Okay. <clears throat> um, so before I get to exactly what is going on in Ohio, Nicole, can you kind of set the scene for how common is sports betting, even though we don't have it here or, you know, in many states, but around the world? Sure. Well, as I mentioned, Sport Radar operates globally. We are on six continents. If Antarctica was habitable, we'd probably be there too. Uh, right now in the United States, we've got a myriad of states who have legalized and regulated sports betting. So since May 14th of 2018, to be exact. We uh, have seen a lot of states roll out regulations and licensing regimes to allow operators and platforms take reign of the industry. 
In Europe, sports betting is ingrained in the culture. If anyone has watched a Premier League game, you'll see that the European Superbooks are embedded on their jerseys. You'll see pop-up advertisements all over the arena, and even in the pregame talk shows. There's betting insights, there's lines, there's different types of snackable tidbits of betting-related info infotainment, if you will. Mm -hmm. So not only in the United States is this going to be a game-changing industry for sports, betting, and states, it's something that we can learn from in the rest of the world. Okay. Kevin, any thoughts on how this is expanding across the U.S.? Yeah, I think generally it's expanding the way most legal professionals expected it to when the Supreme Court made its decision in 2018. I think sort of taking a slightly different angle from what Nicole was saying, um, the expansion, to be clear, is an expansion of state-authorized, re licensed, regulated, above-board, transparent, and taxed for the public good sports betting. But sports betting even without all of those protections and salutatory purposes for the public still exists everywhere as we sit here today in the form of offshore markets, black markets, corner bookies, and all that money is just, because it's subsurface, it's not part of the economy. And there's really no benefit that is coming to the public as a public financing tool that will come from legitimizing sports betting and bringing it within the regulated atmosphere of the gaming industry within these states. Um, if, you, if you look back 100 years, which is a good place to look because this is the 100th anniversary of the 1919 World Series, which was between, of course, our Ohio Cincinnati Reds. I'm from Cincinnati, and as we say in Cincinnati, you know, when people talk about the 1919 World Series being fixed, we would have won anyway. We are just better. <laughs> and, but if you look back 100 years, um, you know, there was betting on sports, and it, and it was covered in the media, um, embedded with the events themselves. The headlines would talk about betting and betters and what they wagered, and it was um, not something that was separated. It was just all embedded or side by side. And, and as time passed, um, that that discussion of the, of the issue was sort of driven further and further underground. And it was really sort of completely driven underground in 1961 when Congress passed the Wire Act, which makes it a crime to place sports bets across state lines. So even today, even with what everything's happening now, you, you'll never be able to, unless Congress acts, to make a bet from a phone, say, here in Ohio with a, with a casino or a sports book operator in Kentucky or Indiana. It'll all be self-contained within the state. And what, what the Wire Act really did was that really put the hurt on the illegal bookmaking industry in the United States. And it sort of just all went away. You know, when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, you know, in Cincinnati, Ohio, they, there's no talking about betting or, you know, how that related to sports or anything. It just wasn't there. Um, and then the internet came along. And, and what happened then when the internet came along is that um, offshore operators started offering sports betting on mobile from the Caribbean, other, other places. And, and that's very widespread now. Um, but still, underground, still not in a place where it can be monitored, where we know what's going on, where the money is, is being generated is at least in part divided to public purposes. And so I think that the Supreme Court decision, what it really does is it allows us to bring an industry that exists. It's, not, it's really not a new industry from a factual perspective, but to bring it um, back into the light and treat it like regular business. And I think that will improve the situation for everyone involved. Kevin raises, a, Kevin raises a really good point. For the longest time, PASPA kept underground something that we all knew was happening. It otherwise was an overreaching end, overreaching means to an end that just increased the black market. So the biggest question burning here today is whether or not legalized sports betting should come to Ohio. And with that comes many benefits. 
you're bringing offshore activity into the light, you're bringing it onshore to licensed regulated sports books. You're protecting consumers by identifying their behavior, regulating it, and giving them a means to seek help when they need with problem gambling and become deeper engaged with their sport of choice. And you're optimizing tax rates so that you can filter that tax revenue to other important constituencies within the state. Uh, Bruce, I suppose you have seen, if you have a program up and running for 10 years, that there's already, I mean, is it gambling in general, sports gambling in particular, or what's, well, what's going on with that? Sports gambling is, um, <coughs> as far as an addiction, is ranked right up there with the casino and the slot machines and things like that, as being that addictive. Mm -hmm. um, the addiction itself is just like any psychoactive drug, like cocaine and things like that, it, but it's a behavioral addiction, so it does change the neural pathways in the brain and how people operate. Um, as I said, the, the amount of the addiction has increased in the last five years from the, when the casino first opened here in Ohio, five years later it's doubled here in Ohio, the addiction rate and people at risk. So whatever the legislation decides, you know, we just want to make sure we have some safeguards in there as far as some funding and taxes that we will see an a increase in addiction with right. the sports betting. And, and Bruce is ab absolutely right about that, that what, if there is legislation that authorizes it, it, it absolutely has to have um, funding and research and uh, ways to study problem gambling and, and encourage responsible gambling so that there is not an increase in problem gambling. Um, I think everyone in the industry supports that and recognizes that that is a, a real issue and, and one that has to be addressed. I would agree with that. I think, at least speaking from an industry perspective, mobile wagering is a huge plus and a huge benefit to policy. Policymakers must recognize that mobile wagering is where the money is to be made. If we look specifically at numbers in New Jersey, we're seeing a handle reach over $300 million per month consistently compared to states who don't reach $50 million in a month because they don't have mobile wagering. In authorizing mobile wagering, you're more easily able to identify problem gambling and get those individuals with addiction the help they need because you're leaving a digital trace. Everything has data behind it. Mm -hmm. You're clicking on the odds. You're trying to swipe into a new app. You're registering. Oftentimes when you open any sports book app in the state of New Jersey right now, you'll need to verify your identity. You'll need to give your address. You'll need to send in a photo ID. So there are means and ways in which regulated sports betting, to your point, might bring more addiction to light, but there's even more ways where it might help us really indicate and find the individuals who need the help. Okay. And I think with the, with the sports betting, I mean, it just, it's fast. Right. And so many different ways you can wager in different games at one time. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to slow it down sometimes. I think with your, your uh, apps and stuff like that, we'll, be able to have pop-ups and say you've been on the phone or you're betting for the last five hours, you want to take a break, you know, mm -hmm. some way to slow it down a little bit. <laughs> you've gone over your $5,000 limit, you know. So, you know, as long sure. as hopefully we address all that. Yeah. Uh, so, Kevin, wh where exactly are we in Ohio? I know there's a competing, there, there's a bill in the Senate, there's a bill in the House. Can you just broadly give us an overview of what's going on there? Sure. There's, as you said, there's, there's two bills. The first bill that was introduced was introduced in the Senate. It's Senate Bill 111. And for just shorthand purposes, I would call that the casino bill. And it's a good piece of legislation, in my particular view, um, in which the um, wagering on sports in Ohio would sort of be centralized and funneled through our existing casino and racino in industry. A person who wanted to place a bet could <clears throat> go to the casino or racino and make a bet in person um, at the counter. Or those companies would have also have mobile apps where you could bet from your phone or your tablet or some kind of mobile device. We live in a mobile society now, uh, for better or worse. 
um, and that's just the reality of it. And um, those are, you know, we, we're fortunate <coughs> in Ohio to have very responsible and excellent operators. Um, these operators have business relationships uh, with, with sports betting experts like Nicole's company and are already doing this in other states. So I have a lot of confidence that those companies would do a tremendous job of running the industry and doing so responsibly and um, in the customer's best interest. Um, the, the, the only downside to that, or the biggest downside that I see to that, is that there's um, a federal excise tax on sports betting, which is an off-the-top tax. Uh, it's a quarter of one cent, which may not sound like very much, but at the end of the day, a quarter of one cent of what they call the handle, the off-the-top, will translate into roughly 5% of the gross win to the state and casino and the people who are operating the businesses. So that's just skimmed off the top and sent to Washington and who knows what happens to it. My view of it is, is it doesn't help anyone. It just disappears. But that and will only happen if it's on the casino side? That's only if it's, a, if it's totally privately run. There's an exemption from the excise tax for state lotteries and agents of state lotteries. Okay. And so the second bill is House Bill 194, which I would shorthandedly call the lottery bill because it creates a role for the lottery, um, sort of as the overseer of sports betting in Ohio. Of course, as with everything with the lottery, the revenue from House Bill 194 would go to education, as it's required by the Ohio Constitution. Back on the Senate side, that you know, what, what would happen with the money publicly is sort of up for discussion. That was left intentionally uh, open for the political process to, to weigh in on. And so, you know, the lottery would um, would be able to, if we if we structured it, if the lawmakers structured it so that the lottery played a role, uh, there certainly could be some cost savings involved in that, and keep keep that money here in Ohio to be used by people in Ohio, which is attractive. And um, that 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 bill originally did not have any mobile uh, wagering, and there extremely limited mobile wagering, but. Um, Last week, there was a substitute version that was brought out. I haven't been able to get my hands on it, but what I have heard is that it pretty much mimics the Senate bill from the mobile side. And, um, and so that's the House bill is, is moving forward a little bit faster. Right now, it's had hearings uh, in the State House, whereas the Senate bill has not been called yet for hearing. So at least as we sit here right now, the, uh, the House version of sports betting is moving forward a little bit close a little bit more um, quickly, but I think it's still up in the air as to what uh, what the final product will look like. I mean, Nicole, from what you're saying though, if mobile is not a part of it, that the market is just not going to develop like most people expect it will. Like, so there are states that have said no, no mobile at all. Right, there are states that have not included mobile in their legislation, and we always, as Sport Radar, use New Jersey as the example because it's the most glaring at this point. Um, like I said, the handle is consistently at 300 million per month, and with that, almost 80 percent, sometimes at 82 percent, of the betting is done mobily. People don't necessarily want to get in their cars and drive to a casino and go to the sports book, place a bet. It also allows for much more sophisticated bet types to be placed in Europe, in Australia, in more sophisticated and mature markets. We see hundreds of bet types offered on a single inning or a quarter, and this is all in play at in-game betting. It's really hard to engage in that type of betting when you have to approach a self-service betting terminal or go to the teller and place your bet when the game's happening fast you're not necessarily going to get up out of your seat and make it to the teller in time before Steph Curry shoots a three-pointer. Baseball is a little bit more forgiving, but oftentimes it's, there's other sports that individuals would like to bet on in-game. And mobile, wa mobile wagering really does allow for that. You really have to have mobile wagering to generate um, a significant revenue generation for the state. For, for public finance, for it to have a public financing purpose, mm -hmm. if you if you simply do it in the casino alone now, you just you'll, you'll generate a few dollars. But it it will because of the way sports betting works, it it will be orders of magnitude less than if you have it on mobile. And 
Um, so I think that the states who have come out and just had brick and mortar operations without mobile have learned that. Um, they've quickly pivoted some of them and said, okay, yeah, we, we see this now. We're, we're gonna add mobile too. Rhode Island is one of those that is doing that. Because when you, when you bet on sports, you know, the, the handle is what is the amount the better bets. So mm -hmm. the, the hold or the gross win is what the casino keeps and is what, what the tax is based on. And generally speaking, on a straight sports bet, the, the hold's gonna be 5% of the handle. So if, if somebody bets a dollar, what the casino's gonna hang on to when all the bets are settled and resolved is gonna be a nickel. So it's, it's easy to look at numbers, especially on the handle, and see these huge numbers and think, oh, we're gonna generate a you know, tremendous amount of revenue, um, but the number will always be considerably less than the handle. Nevertheless, the, the handle numbers are so big that you, know, you can generate eight-figure numbers per year, and you know, we'll see what happens in some of those higher populated states it may it could possibly be even $100 million in New York a year in tax revenue once those markets become mature. Mm -hmm. um, it's very uh, interesting right now to watch the states roll out you know, and, and, and try to um, establish their foothold and get their markets going because they, they're all doing it out of the same uh, environment in which we all exist, which is nobody's familiar with this you know, in Ohio from you know, a regular business perspective. Sure, there are people who are out there betting and they know how to bet and they're corner bookies, but they're not gonna come forward and, and be part of you know, what's going on right now. So the institutionalization of this market, and that's what it is, it's a market. It's, it is similar, it is at least as similar to the commodities exchange of trading corn and beans and cattle futures and things like that. I, I've done a lot of agricultural work, so I have familiarity with that too. It's not exactly the same, but it has a lot of similarity to it. Probably a little bit more to commodities trading than, than equities, than stock, stock exchange, but there's some overlap in, this, in the stock market too. And sports betting has, a, at least from a business perspective, it shares as much DNA with those markets as it does with the slot machines and the table games and uh, the roulette wheels that are in the casino right now. Well, so it's really a hybrid product. I still think that betting on baseball would be more exciting than betting on soybeans, but I'll, I'll see. <laughs> oh, you've point. never been in a good soybean market, then, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> you wait till the fall. You see what the soybean market looks like after all this rain. It'll be wild. So, Kevin, you brought up the Cincinnati Reds, so uh, let's talk about Pete Rose. Um, and specifically the integrity of the game. Uh, is there a concern uh, with the expansion of sports betting that uh, we won't be able to trust the games? And I guess, Nicole, do you want to jump in first on that? Uh, sure, absolutely. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that regulating sports betting and bringing the activity to light gives us an opportunity to further protect the integrity of sport. And that's because Bringing this activity to light allows us to see the bets that are being placed. Sport Radar has an entire division that we've coined our integrity services, where we help leagues, federations, and organizations, as well as law enforcement agencies around the world in over 80 countries to identify suspicious betting activity, help find fraudulent behavior and see, seek out and help prosecute individuals who are engaging in the corruption of sport. Without these betting markets and without the ability to monitor that activity at a regulated level with licensed sports books and see the data that's being made in real time from punters and players all over the world, there would be much more of a threat. But the data itself speaks to the protection and the ability for a regulated and licensed sports betting market to further enhance the protection of the competition itself. Yeah, oh, go, ahead. go ahead, Bruce, jump I, in. I was just gonna say that, um, you know, with the new sports betting, it'll be for colleges, and, and you know, I, I just know that they are at a high risk, these young athletes and stuff, and, you know, risking their, it's tempting, it's, you know, um, they, they're risking their scholarships and uh, even a, a ability to play in any further games. So it's just they're very vulnerable and, you know, 
Sure, you, ra you raise a really good point, but we also have to think that the market itself is incentivized to ensure that everything is kept fair. The very nature of sports is that it's uncertain and unpredictable. We're not sure what's going to happen. Kevin Durant was injured, Clay's out. We don't know for sure whether or not the basket's going to be made at the end of the game when the buzzer's going off. So that uncertainty and that self-regulation to allow the operators, the players, the teams and the leagues to remain uncertain will not only increase the revenue that we generate as an industry, but also the tax revenue, because a compromised sport is no fun to bet on. I think, I think Bruce has the, hit the exact word. It's, vul, it's vulnerable is the key word. I think that there's no way and there never will be any way to say that nobody will ever become vulnerable and after they become vulnerable and desperate, do something that they shouldn't have done that in some way, large or small, is a corruption of the integrity of a performance on the athletic field. Um, you know, pe pe but, I, but, but history has shown us for decades that it's, it's isolated in this incidents. It tends to be an, a vulnerable individual as opposed to sort of a systemic undermining of the whole competitive process. I don't, I don't think you can undermine the com competitive process today, uh, or at least it would be extremely hard, because everything now, especially in the social media and with the, with the sport radar integrity monitoring services, everything is so transparent in the sunshine, and people will just behave differently when they know they're being watched than when they think they're in the dark and no one's seeing what they're doing. And so I think from that perspective, it's just, it would just be so much harder to do that today than it was 100 years ago when the New York City bookmakers fixed the World Series. We also have you know, just the, the underlying business of sports is so much more sophisticated and complex. You know, we have unions and we have agents and we have league commissioners and we have all these people who are in the mix who just kind of by their very presence and what they do in the business creates organic protection you know, against corruption. So I, I don't worry um, at night at all about you know, the games being fundamentally changed. I don't, I don't think it can happen. I think that um, what makes the sports business so uh, appealing and, and valuable is that people like rivalry. You know, I mean, if I say OH, I know what you people are going to say, and I, if I say, you know, that, but I'm not going to talk about that school up north, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, there's a huge Ohio State-Michigan rivalry, and I think even if you had something that happened, uh, unfortunately, in a rivalry like that, it wouldn't change the rivalry. It'd still be the rivalry. It might still go back the next year. It would still be the same. So I think that sports are very resilient. They're very uh, organically uh, protected against this. Um, well, that, I think the sports where you have to look out for are more of the, the individual sports, tennis and you know where, where somebody could do something completely on their own. Whenever you, you get into the team atmosphere, it's awfully hard to keep a secret when a lot of people have to collaborate to reach the result. Well, that being said, though, I mean, have the pro have the pro leagues or the tennis association have they embraced gambling? Are they still opposed to it? And, and is it different in college? Do you want to take that, Nicole? Sure. Well, Sport Radar specifically works with a lot of major leagues in the U.S. Some of our few integrity partners are among the likes of the NBA, the NHL, MLS, NASCAR, the MLB, and these leagues recognize the vulnerability. Uh, we work with not only the U.S. leagues and these domestic-based federations, but global organizations around the world to educate, consult, provide services that are hands-on to identify potential match fixers and corrupt behaviors to allow them to understand that maybe this individual is approaching you because they're a fan, they think you're a great athlete, or maybe they're approaching you because they want to develop a relationship with you, so you'll later on be more incentivized to fit, fix a match for them. But the leagues that Sport Radar works with have certainly understood that vulnerability and are welcome to that education. So their athletes, their staff, their coaches mm -hmm. know how to identify the behavior and really hit 
hit the nail on the head to eliminate it. It's been, it's been tough on the leaks to be candid about it. You know, you're talking about a, um, a big culture change. Sports betting and, and the underlying leagues and the games have always been like com com kept completely separate. Um, you know, prior to everybody getting a smartphone, Nevada was a little town in the desert and there was no professional team around there and very little college activity too. So it was, it was physically remote from where all the major action in sports was going on. And it was not networked. It was you couldn't virtually connect to it. And now, you know, as a result of the Supreme Court decision, we're just smashing the sports leagues and the gaming companies together and saying, hey, guy, hey, check it out. You're neighbors now. You live right next to each other. And so there's been some um, interesting debate, certainly, amongst uh, the leagues and the gaming companies as they all try to you know, understand what their relationships are going to look like going forward in the future. I've sort of been at conferences, the person who's sort of tried to nudge them in the direction of, hey, it's okay if you talk to each other, you know, it's, there's, this doesn't have to remain separate because I don't think it can remain completely separate um, in the day and age in which we live. And I think they'll all get there. I think, I think in the end that, um, that there will be, that they will be smoothly functioning relationships which will maximize the protection of the integrity of the market and maximize the public benefit that come from regulating this and bringing it you know, up from the subsurface to be transparent and, and part of regular business. Yeah. I was just going to say that uh, my colleagues here, they speak about business and you know, big picture macro stuff, but you know, I'm, I'm working with the individuals that I know that will be the addiction rates will increase with the sports betting. Um, gambling is a hidden addiction. You know, people can go long periods of time without being detected. Um, you know, I don't see gambling in your eyes. I don't smell lottery breath. I don't see numbers in a urine screen. <laughs> but by the time they come for help, they've lost relationships, houses, job. you know. Suicide is the number one addict, uh, result of gambling than any other addiction, suicidal ideation. It's got a very high correlation of domestic violence along with it. Because um, most couples, what do they argue about? It's money. So the individual who I work with, you know, it's whether it's organized teams and stuff like that, I have a client that is in sales, IT sales. So he's on his phone all the time. But during the day, he's also run up in the last, in three months, $150,000 in debt on sports betting, even though it's illegal, mm -hmm. but he's still doing it. Whether it becomes legal or not, I'm sure he's still going to do it. Um, but, you know, it's just scary when, how easy as it is. You know, I don't know how to use half of these things on this phone, but <laughs> I have a smartphone. It is smarter than me, so. Awesome. Okay, we are uh, going to take questions here in just a moment, so uh, don't be shy. There is a microphone at the side of the room, so if you have uh, a question that you would like to ask, you can walk over there. Uh, but um, uh, I will ask uh, another question of our panelists while uh, while people get uh, get lined up there. Um, and uh, uh, Kevin, I think you mentioned the, the the Wire Act or something. I mean, is there a chance that that Congress does something that uh, that kind of makes this all a, a moot point in Ohio? I think the odds of that happening in the short term are very, very low. Okay. Um, I don't see you know, the federal issue being one of to put the genie back in the bottle and try to increase prohibition again. I think that there's a general consensus yeah. that the prohibition is a failed policy. Um, I think that over time, if inefficiencies develop, if, if the relationships do not grow in a productive way that you could see um, some of the stakeholders want to, to have a, a federal element to the regulation. But my personal view, I, I, don't, I don't see Congress trying to go back to uh, uh, just don't do this policy again. Right, so it's more of a state thing. Okay, it is CMC's tradition to take audience uh, questions, so uh, please step up to the mic, state your name, ask your question. CMC members can repeat after me, avoid editorial comments, and remember questions and with a question mark. Go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you for coming. This was very informative. 
um, I, I couldn't help but think while I was listening that um, gambling is the only industry that wins when the customer loses. Um, and, and I thought that was interesting. I also was kind of uh, horrified to hear that, that since Hollywood has been, uh, gambling has been in Ohio, it, 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 the, the casualties have doubled. Um, and I remember hearing when they were trying to bring it to Ohio that, that the money was leaving Ohio um, uh, and, and uh, we would get the money without any change. I also remember that when Art Sleister was here, uh, as one of our speakers, he said that convenience uh, 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 breeds usage, and, and um, it's kind of frightening that the iPhone uh, is, is gonna be used. My question is, um, uh, you also made an interesting point about knowing, because you're using the iPhone, the controls that you'll know who's abusing uh, the gambling, who's, who's the obituary gambler, whatever. Uh, what is in the legislation to motivate the um, uh, uh, sports betting organizations to report that or to do something about it? Um, since it obviously, if they do something about it, it cuts into their profits. So is there something in the legislation that will require them to report that to authorities or to do something about it? Great. Good question. I will kick the legislative part of that over to Kevin. He's probably much more uh, poised than I am to answer the Ohio-specific legislative, legislative um, piece of it. But with respect to your comment on controls, of course this is an, an issue for policymakers, whether or not it's the legislator or the regulator. But the controls that could be instilled in a mobile app or could be instilled on a digital website aren't those that we can control in brick and mortar casinos. You might be turned away at the teller's desk, but it's much easier to flip a switch or hit a button and shut off someone's access if an operator or a state who is actually governing that operator and responsible for their licensure, which is the golden ticket into the industry, um, can flip the switch and stop the problem gambler from the activity. It's going to be a state-by-state -state determination, and I'm confident that Ohio and other states alike have very educated policymakers and individuals, such as my colleagues here, to help curtail that behavior. If I could real quick, yeah. Yeah. since Please. you're gonna bring in the Ohio part, what, um, I know at the casino there's a voluntary exclusion program. Right. Is that something that'll be, is poised in the- in Yes, the absolutely. Mm -hmm. bill? That'd be part of it. Mm -hmm. I think that that's where it starts. I think that the traditional tool uh, in gaming, whether it, it be traditional table games and the like in the casino or sports betting is self-exclusion by the player to give notice that, um, that I have a problem with this and just don't let me do it. And so that will all apply in the legislation to, um, to sports betting if adopted here in Ohio going forward. I think some of the things with the mobile um, is still maybe a little little bit out. It's it's still being developed. It's still being researched and technologically applied. Um, reason I'm looking at my phone here is not to be rude, but uh, Keith White of the National Council on Problem Gambling, who I met in Las Vegas, wonderful guy, um, very very like um, Bruce here, very concerned about problem gambling, researches it, studies it, tries to help people. Um, says that that he absolutely believes and have long held you can perhaps provide a safer gambling experience with account-based online wagering, and certainly there's a lot of potential in both this new technology and big d data to deliver more customized, personalized, responsible gambling experience. But then you bring up Arch Schleister. I mean, we're in Columbus, Ohio, and you know, I mean, I, I just don't have an answer for that. Um, I hear what Bruce says that you know what we can sit up here at, at a higher level and talk about business and things like that. But these issues are personal and they're, they're very individually based. And I think that we as an industry cannot forget that. And we have to support people like Bruce and Dr. Keith White who are the frontline soldiers in that defense and make sure that they get what they need and try to help them figure out better ways to figure out when an individual may be um, starting down a path of self-destruction because nobody wants to see that happen. 
and it's um, certainly something that medical science has identified and and dealt with and we just we need to continuously improve in that area got it okay next question good afternoon my name is hugo trux charter member i'm interested in the scope of the gambling current um, of the proposed legal gambling and even what goes on does it include college sports does it include high school sports does it include pb sports does it include political elections does it include whether or not the columbus teachers are going to go on strike i'm curious on the scope yeah. I'll, I'll take that. Um, this, the legislation that we that is currently in in Ohio would include all professional sports and college sports. That's where it would end. There would not be any high school betting on high school sports. There would not be betting on any junior high school sports. Um, the Casino Control Commission under both bills would play a key role in approving what, what you would call as a bet, as a proposition. Um, typically what happens in the states that already do this is if they have a novel proposition, a political election or who's gonna win the Heisman Trophy or something that's other than just, you know, who's gonna win between the Browns and the Steelers, um, you have to go to your regulator and get approval of those kinds of bets. So the regulator will help to keep that from, uh, you know, kind of going off into infinity because they are bets or ideas and they're only limited uh, without regulation by the human imagination. So, but I think what we're talking about here in Ohio is, um, you know, sort of an entry level sports betting program in which we have, you know, what are long established traditional bets on outcomes of games, total points and the like. Um, you know, we, we had, we've seen, and I think this played a big role in why we're sitting up here before you today. You know, we've seen the daily fantasy um, industry emerge back, especially in 2014 and 2015, which I think, you know, greatly advanced the um, acceptance of sports betting. I mean, at the end of the day, you're speculating on performances of athletes in daily fantasy, and I call that gambling. You know, I think that's mm -hmm. what that is. And I think that those are sort of what you would call exotic proposition bets. And so I think that within the industry, um, there is a good grasp of, of you know, what, what the market will like and what it won't. And as far as betting on, you know, is the next pitch gonna be a ball or is the next pitch gonna be a strike? You know, you'll hear people talk about that, but the reality of it is, is you know, there's, there's the bettors want a liquid market. In other words, they're, they're not betting just to bet, they're betting to win something. And if you're gonna you know, set up a proposition that's gonna have a life of you know, a few seconds between pitches, there's no time for any liquidity to form. There's no time for any prize to come into existence in which uh, a person could, could make it worth their while. So I think like a lot of talk about that is, is considerably overblown, that that's just not, that it's just not economically going to be attractive, and and uh, people who run sports books, they prefer economically attractive propositions to ones that nobody but, cares but about. But yeah, I know you can like, and I think it's maybe it's in England. You can bet on the Oscars. You can bet on the Queen's baby's name, or you know Prince William's baby's name, stuff like that. Is that you see that in the U.S. at all, Nicole? We haven't seen that in the okay. United States, um, not, so not up to this I mean. point, maybe <clears throat> jokingly between family members or friends, but right. um, Kevin raises a good point about proposition bets though, and to the question, an operator isn't necessarily interested in offering a proposition bet on a player that could be compromised in any way, and this goes back to the integrity of a sport. It, the uncertainty and the competition is the attractiveness of sports betting and the attractiveness of the outcome to the punter and to the operator. Those proposition bets that are a little bit more high risk, that are likely to be compromised or otherwise likely to result in a refund, aren't going to be offered and it's not something that we've been seeing trending in state legislation so far. Okay, next question. Hi, my name's Trip Lazarus. Um, and I know this is coming, um, and I'm generally in favor of things that have been uh, shoved into the dark coming into the light because that's the only way we can regulate them at all. But I can't say that this doesn't make me kind of sad. 
um, because there is such a the cocaine aspect to a quick bet. And I mean, I can see myself, you know, I don't, I don't gamble. I don't like casinos. Uh, but gee, oh, we might get involved in this game a little bit more. And, uh, and then it's just, you know, we talk about all the money that's going to come out of this. Well, where's that coming from? It's coming from people um, who we're skimming it off of because of fairly addictive behavior. On the other hand, you know, I guess my question is, with this coming out into the light, how many more people start gambling that weren't? And so how many more people do we have in trouble that weren't? Okay. Well, we know in five years in the state of Ohio, gambling has increased, it doubled. Um, if, yeah, please. Did, I mean, did you see, the, did we see this when the lottery was introduced and then when Kino was expanded and then when the casinos came out? Like, do you see very specific correlations between expanded gambling and the expanded numbers? I mean, is it just a straight shot like that? I don't have that information, but okay. I know the state did a survey mm -hmm. when, before the casino started then five years later. And that's, okay. that's what I'm going off of. Nicole? Yeah, I'd just, I'd just raise two points on that. Um, with respect to the number of individuals betting, the American Gaming Association reports, and this is to date, between 150 to 450 billion dollars are bet by Americans. And that's not just in states that are legal, that's also in states that there's sports betting illegal. So bringing this to light helps us monitor, helps us identify. It's not necessarily as an attractive of a fee if it's, a, if it's legal now because it's brought into the light, it's not as cool, it's not as trendy to do something that's illegal. And um, further to that point, it's something that's beneficial, as I said before, for that absorption. It helps tax revenue, it helps us filter this back into meaningful and good programs and incentives for the constituencies that might be affected the most. Okay, next question. Yes, my name is Merle Wayman, I'm a retired employment attorney. Um, many kids enjoy sports. Many kids have access to uh, iPhones and computers where they could engage in uh, sports gambling. My question is, do the proponents of sports gambling, are they attempting to target this group in an effort to expand upon sports gambling, not only to people who are of majority age, but also to minors? And if the answer is no, then how, how do you control um, my, an access of a minor to engage, from engaging in sports gambling? Okay. You raise a good point. Uh, there's oftentimes an 18 years old or 21 year old restriction on a state by state basis to engage in sports betting. But your, your point is definitely well received and, and taken. There, certainly are advertising restrictions and consumer protection laws that service not only the gambling industry but other industries that might be considered high risk or restricted categories um, to, help, to help curtail that. Um, specifically in Ohio, I'm not familiar with the restrictions that are being proposed in the legislature, but it's one thing that we are confident policymakers will find a way to ensure remains safe. Okay. The, uh, the regulators, too, they, they penalize whether it's sports betting or gaming, you know, underage gambling uh, severely. Um, you know, I have, I have minor children, so, you know, I, I wish I could give you a better answer than, than, than I currently have right now. You know, when I talked to Keith White in Las Vegas, he said talk to him about it. He said don't just assume that they'll figure it out for themselves, explain it to them and what's going on. And, You'll, you should do fine. So, but as far as the targeting is, absolutely not. This is not an industry that is targeting, targeting minors. And, you know, part of the, you know, it's just wrong. I think, it's, I think people, people know that's wrong, obviously. But I think a lot of lawyers in my general uh, age bracket, as my mom would say, um, have lived through cigarette big tort litigation and asbestos yeah. big tort litigation and we were involved in that and we, we know what that looks like and we don't want any part of that. So it would just be bad business. Okay. We're, oh, go ahead. We're also seeing a different demographic engage in sports betting. Typically the average sports better is a 30 year old male 
and that 30-year-old demographic is extremely impressionable to targeted advertising and is more likely to engage in behaviors or refrain from engaging in behaviors that is he or she is seeing on their phone scrolling through social media. This again goes back to the problem gambling points where you're able to kind of curtail behaviors and maybe market in a way that encourages healthy sports betting as an adult of the legal age and in a capacity that is safe and regulated um, to ensure that you are not necessarily doing something that still is illegal. And the, reg the regulators will have some regulation of advertising and media exposure in some, some cases. I mean, there's always the First Amendment that, you know, is out there and allows people to advertise their products, but there is some regulation of that. Okay, last question. It's likely that when sports gambling comes to pass here, collegiate sports betting is going to be primarily on one team at one institution. But the, yeah, but, the, <laughs> but the majority of collegiate athletes in this state, uh, even if you limit it to football and basketball, are D2, D3, NAIA, and even some unaffiliated institutions. And while Ohio State has the capacity to put infrastructure in place, staff training, monitoring, to deal with these issues, small colleges that even some of you went to do not, and yet those are also the targeted bets. The University of Mount Union goes to the national championship every other year. Finley went to the basketball championship a couple of years ago. What are these schools supposed to do with the wide open law that Ohio is now contemplating? And second, uh, something you haven't brought up at all, uh, eSports, which are the fastest growing sports, which some legislators have told me are not sports. Uh, and well, most legislators are the age of people in this room, or um, they don't understand this is a real sport, it's very quickly growing, and is built around the premise of wagering in many ways. Uh, how, how can the state deal with these two issues? Well, I think the universities, if we're going to focus on college sports and collegiate sports, are, are struggling with that right now, and they are trying to develop policies and procedures that will um, be effective for them. Uh, I, it's on their radar screen and they are um, drafting those th things up and considering, you know, how to do that. It, it is concededly, I think, a little bit harder for the intercollegiate environment than it is for the professional environment. There's 160,000 student athletes generally every year at the Division I level who are playing college sports. You can, you can cut that number way down initially because they're not going to be markets made on a lot of the games involved, involving Division II teams and stuff like that. Yeah, there'll, there'll be a line on a Division III championship when Mount Union goes and whacks whoever they're playing and they win, they go every year. They don't go every other year, they go every year it seems like. So that's a great program up in Alliance, Ohio. and. Um, so, that, so I think, you know, if you're talking about if it only happens in Division Three one time a year, that, um, you know, those are the, the, the one-time event is the most scrutinized event, whether it's the Super Bowl or the Division Three National Championship, and that can easily be handled. I don't expect there to be markets developing on the John Carroll versus Mount Union game, you know, in week six of the football season or something like that. But the Big Ten and the, and the major schools that where there's heavy betting every week on their games certainly are going to have to get together and you know develop some safeguards for themselves and ways to police it. One more question. Hi, uh, Andy Campbell. Thanks <laughs> okay. for being here today. Just a quick question. So we're hearing a lot about the business and the industry and the teams, but I don't recall seeing the people protesting at the State House for gambling in the state of Ohio. What's the motivation behind this? Where is it coming from? Is It's not the will of the people. Where is it coming from? Well, I think it is um, recognized that it's a source of revenue for the state that can be um, tapped and, and grown. I think that that is the, the largest motivation for public policy to move forward with it. So it's a positive motivation as opposed to, to a negative motivation. And I think it's, you know, partially just uh, evolution of the generations too and that, you know, 
probably the, the data is pushing it along too. That's my view. Well, I've been known to get the stick out and stir the pot up, but um, you know, we had we voted on the casinos coming in. Is this going to be something that Joe Citizen is going to be able to voice an opinion with the sports betting? Well, I, I think that'll be up to the state house, so I'll dodge it and say that'll be up to the people who have put forth the law and maybe some lawyers down the road. Um, but th there are states where that is happening. Colorado, uh, the General Assembly authorized a referendum to the people as to whether or not they want sports betting in Colorado, and that will be held later in the fall. And, and I'm a betting guy. I bet anything that it passes, that it's, it will pass. I think that nationally, there is a sweeping, if you're, if you're going to do it on politics, that sports betting has never been more popular, uh, both in the state house and amongst the electorate. Um, you you, you probably, probably didn't pay attention to this, but I did when we had our last governor's race. Um, the governor may not appreciate me remembering this, but I think Governor DeWine originally came out and said, oh, I don't think we should do that. And then he saw the numbers and what happened. And it was the 24 or 48 hour period he was. He said, yeah, I support it. So, you know, there's really not a lot of um, let's, let's keep it prohibited uh, political will out there. There's, there's strong political will to, again, bring it out from the underground and create transparency and public finance. On a, fi on a final note there, I don't actually know any of these protesters. We're not on a first, first name basis just yet, but I can say generally speaking, they're with change comes uncertainty. If there is uncertainty, um, speaking from industry and speaking from experience, there are sophisticated entities, organizations, individuals out there who are on the ground in this industry globally, Sport Radar being one of them, helping to protect the competition, protect the integrity of sport, work with organizations who look at individuals at an individual personal level to help their problems who work with the operators. Like I said before, Sport Radar is at the epicenter of all of this. We know the leagues, we know the operators, we know the regulators, and there are individuals there to help curtail that uncertainty so that the industry can become a healthy marketplace for future entertainment for years to come. I just want to put a shout out to uh, the state of Ohio. Um, when we got the casinos in uh, Ohio, you know, they have the Ohio for Responsible Gaming. We have four state agencies working together, which is kind of unique. But we've done so much great, so, so, such great work that uh, Keith White and the National Conference on Problem Gaming, we hosted the National Conference here last year up in Cleveland, not Cincinnati, but Cleveland. Hi, Cleveland. And, um, you know, it just shows all the good work and the stuff we're doing in Ohio. And I just like to see, I don't know if it has to be such a rush to get into the sports betting. I think it's been, what, a year since they yes. opened it up. So I hope our legislators um, do, their, do their jobs. I think we all feel sure. that way. I hope you all enjoyed today's forum and found it interesting and important in the future. Let's thank our sponsors, Shoemaker, Loop, and Kendrick, and our speakers, Nicole metzger Shaw, Bruce Jones, Kevin Bragg, and Doug Buchanan. And thanks to all of you for being here. We look forward to seeing you next week.